Um, so I'm Jen from Databricks, and I just want to thank you all for coming, and we want to thank Uber for hosting us tonight. Uh, so we're going to have two talks, uh, the first one from Uber, and then we're going to have TD from Databricks uh, do a, a quick talk after that. So um, I'm just going to welcome Aaron up. He's going to give you a little intro, and then we'll get started. Thanks. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Schildkraut. I run the data team at Uber. We are extremely excited to have everybody here and to be hosting this. This is awesome. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to the people on the Uber team who put in a ton of energy to organize this and make this happen. Um, you guys are awesome, and it's, it's great that you did this. I'm really glad that we're supporting the community uh, in their work and in this kind of gathering. So uh, just super quickly, I'm going to be very, very quick, and we'll get to the meat of things. Um, Uber is, is really simple, actually. You just like open an app and you press a button and a car shows up and then you like get in and you drive. There's a monetary transaction, you get out and you're where you want to go. Um, it's massive. Because it's so simple, our ability to scale globally is huge. And because it's so simple, our ability to automate this process at m huge global scale is unbelievable, um, which presents this incredible data opportunity fundamentally. So in a sense, like our, our team, we've centralized data into a full stack team that includes everything from our core infrastructure all the way through embedded data science. And the sort of mission of this team is to automate Uber fundamentally, um, to use intelligence to make everything about our app and about this extremely simple experience that millions and millions of people around the globe are engaging and to make this um, truly optimal and truly automated. And, and that is, again, fundamentally like a data problem. Um, and because it's so simple, we actually sort of get to the essence of what it means to automate an experience like this. In, in, in a sense, we're trying to um, bring intelligence in an automated and basically real-time way with cars that all over the globe right now are moving around and carrying people around. Um, to, to make that happen at, at this a, a tremendous scale. So all these data problems, what it means to solve th those intelligence problems in relative real time um, are really like crystallized here. Uh, there's very little messiness. It's very much just like how do we optimize pricing? How do we tell a driver that they're about to get into an accident and help them avoid that accident beforehand? How do we optimize supply positioning so that when you go press that button, there is a car right there already because we know that it's extremely likely that you or somebody like you is going to request a car at that moment? Um, and, and dozens of other problems like this, but that are all really like simple. They're really crystallized on this one map with these people all over the world trying to get where they want to go. Um, so that's made data extremely exciting here. Um, it's made engaging with Spark extremely exciting. I think we're at the beginning of that journey. Uh, we've made some awesome strides uh, so far and that will be an ongoing uh, uh, adventure and we're very much behind, uh, behind that project and this project and all the work that people in this room are doing. So uh, super excited to have all of you here. Thank you for coming. And I'm going to pass this to Vinoth, who is going to talk about what he's going to talk about. Here we go. Thank you all. Hey, thank you, Aaron. Um, once again, welcome everyone to Uber. And uh, this is the first time that we are talking very extensively about our data infrastructure. So we're incredibly excited to have you all here. And this talk is basically going to be about our ongoing evolution of our data ecosystem and how Spark has been instrumental towards where we've gotten to. And um, so first of all, who am I? Uh, I'm Vinod. And later, you'll also be hearing from Kelvin and Reza on, on the respective things that they've been working on. And uh, we are among the early uh, engineers on Hadoop and Spark at Uber. What this really means is we joined at a time where there was no cluster, there was no data even. And we've been, you know, since then working with this amazing team that we have, working really hard to sort of unlock data uh, to all of Uber. Uh, I think Aaron put it very crisply. Our mission is to just democratize access to data uh, to everyone at Uber, the engineers, the people who are running our cities, and, and so forth. And we are sort of, you know, getting started. Um, in this talk, um, I'm going to briefly discuss our overall sort of architecture, where we are going towards and where we were, and then use uh, how we power like our trips pipeline into our existing warehouse as a concrete example of the sort of business critical problems that we are solving using uh, Hadoop and Spark. And uh, specifically, we'll go into two projects that we've been working on. 
One is Paragon. Paragon is a massive effort for us to go to to go to go and turn all the historical JSON data that we had, you know, schematize them and make them in turn them into parquet files and it's now really consumable, it has a contract and so forth, and it truly sort of unlocks the value of data in a, in a really true sense of the word. And uh, I notify DStream. So this is some futuristic work that we've been working on, um, primarily motivated by some sort of use cases that we have, um, where we are trying to see if the existing patterns of processing data on HDFS can be, some of them can be better replaced by, you know, using iNotify in HD, HDFS and, la you know, processing the files as they land. And uh, Reza is going to go over that. And then we'll also give you a glimpse into what we have for the future. And then sort of, um, you know, this is more of a breath talk, as you can see. And uh, totally hit us up either after the talk offline here or even offline. If you want to go deeper into uh, any of these areas, I'll be really excited to talk to uh, anyone who's interested. All right. So before we go too far, what's Uber? Um, Uber's mission is providing transportation as reliable as running water right, uh, to everyone and to everywhere. So to fulfill this promise so far, we operate in over 300 cities and across 60 uh, countries, and we're still growing, right? And then uh, when, so I, I, I worked in a lot of, uh, a couple of internet startups before this, and I think what really sets Uber apart is the kind of real connection that we have with the physical world. Uh, we're not like a you know, web startup. We are actually moving real people and real things and their consequences to the actions of our systems. And that has been like, uh, you know, an amazing thing to observe every day and, and now that's a good segue into you know going into what's what's data, what's the impact of data at Uber. So um, I I tend to think of Uber as one giant optimization problem, um, and then data holds answers to most of the you know uh, s the problems that we have, as like you know Aaron also mentioned, and um, the impact of data at Uber is pretty huge. Uh, in a sense that we have 2,000 uh, unique users who are accessing our data on a weekly basis. These are people who are, you know, actually running our cities and making sure things are working, and then, you know, um, trying to make sure every single trip has a good uh, user experience and it's fair to our partners and so forth, right? And these people are. Other than our you know, usual dashboards and roll-up analytics and that sort of stuff, we are also using data in a fundamental way to sort of power you know, some of the critical business operations, the so payments, right? Paying our partners, for example, fraud, and trying to decide where to, you know, as a company, invest in marketing. And then background checks for the drivers that we are onboarding. So we are we're truly data driven in the in the sense of the word here. Technically uh, speaking, we have some unique and interesting problems. Um, we have starting from the age old sort of fundamental economic problem of supply versus demand and how we we, we tend to grow our cities as their you know, own individual startups and each startup needs you know some data to see how they want to you know invest how they want to pivot and so forth so data plays like a fundamental way in how we've grown and this is something very close to the uh, the you know the dna of uber and then uh, like geo is very first class citizen and we have a lot of geo temporal problems that that can be tackled and then again, uh, latency is king. Like we try to do uh, pretty much everything as quickly as possible, like within the limits of the technical, you know, feasibility of the problem. Of course, um, there is enormous value in making data available as soon as possible, uh, as you would see, like you know, later on when we talk about how we do trips. Um, so, quick, quick detour into what what we are moving from, right? So. Like with any uh, company, we had uh, a bunch of application logs, mostly in Kafka. These are being you know, bulk uploaded to Amazon S3. People were using, um, running EMR jobs on a non-demand basis. And then um, we then later for our own sort of gold-plated data use cases. This is the, you know, we, we are using like a standard RDBMS-ish relational warehouse. And then this is the data that is like gold plated, right? Like all the stuff that I talked about before, all these critical operations, this is the data that has to be reliable and has to be there for the business to sort of function. And then we build our own in-house uh, Celery Python placed uh, sort of ETL system. And uh, things got, things were pretty well, right? So true to Uber's DNA, we moved quickly, 
like did what needs to be done for the business and then to grow Uber. But then the thing is we grew pretty fast. <laughs> so as we added more cities, we have we, you know, staffed them with more operational people. So um, as the scale increased, we hit a, like a bunch of problems with this existing system, right? Which is, so we couldn't scale to high volume Kafka streams um, because this is fundamentally a batch pool sort of uh, ingestion system. And then uh, this system that we had wasn't, that architecture wasn't built for multi-DC. Say for trips is one of the most important data sets at Uber, right? Obviously, because everything will be joined against trips. So we, the strips data sits across multiple data centers and we need to get all of them into like a single data center in like a sort of a merged view for us to do critical things like payments. So this is stuff that is not uh, tackled in the existing architecture. And the overall ingestion model itself is goes back to the traditional sort of warehouse design, right? You push uh, transformations and projections into the pipeline. Uh, people used to do that because storage is, was used to be expensive. And then networks used to be not that fast or reliable. So you try to limit the amount of information that you ingest into your traditional warehouses. But with Hadoop, uh, we, we want to move to like the new world, right? Where um, we want to get raw data onto HDFS and they later rely on something like Spark, which can do you know very large scale processing to, to figure out the transformations later on. So uh, this decoupling, as we see again later, um, is it like fundamentally uh, sort of an important thing. And most of all, we did not have any sort of uh, contracts between the producers and the consumers of data. So think about the scale, right? Uh, we have hundreds of engineers who are moving really fast because Uber, as a company, we want to build new products and we move fast. But then there are thousands of people who want the same data and there is no contract between them. So if there is a data breakage that happens, it's actually fundamentally crippling to the business. So this is also some like, you know, an inherent flaw with the architecture that we saw. So first sort of business for us was to get reliable data into the into HDFS first, and we use Spark all along, along the way. And quickly, uh, before I hand it off to Kelvin and Reza, um, so this is what we did. Uh, we started out building these uh, bunch of these data delivery services, which land raw data onto HDFS. And thanks to Paragon, which Kelvin will go into more detail, we are able to bootstrap all the historical data that we had in Amazon S3 back into HDFS as well. Like uh, that way, um, HDFS now becomes a source of truth for data at Uber. And then HDFS is horizontally scalable, as all of us know. And this becomes a much more sustainable model. And then from here on, for any processing needs, Park has pretty much been our de facto processing uh, engine, of, engine of choice. And Paricon itself is written in Spark. And tactically, what we started out doing was load this raw data using Spark SQL into our uh, you know, Ola warehouse. This solved a bunch of these ingestion problems that we had. And then um, we are now at a point with the basics in place, we are trying to invest into a more uh, solid, more longer term ingestion system using Spark and Spark Streaming, which you know a little bit of what uh, Reza will talk about later on. And then we also plan to open like a access to this raw data and um, the ingested data rather uh, with Spark jobs and Hive and uh, you know, machine learning and all the fun stuff that can be unlocked with Spark. So quickly, um, this will be very short. So what's the true problem, right? So just this is just to say that um, we're not experimenting with this. We are actually doing something as critical as paying our partners via this pipeline. Um, so the trips problem basically is, is the most important data set at Uber. So every trip needs to be accounted for because every trip needs to be accounted into how we pay our partners. And the trips are now stored in Uber schemaless data stores. Uh, we did like a good at scale talk yesterday. I really encourage you guys to take a look at that too. So it's basically a sharded NoSQL database with a big table-ish model that's built on top of MySQL. And the problem basically is uh, we need to get a consolidated view of this data across the DCs quickly in like end to end one to two hours. So this latency comes from the fact that some of our partners end their shift at say 3 a.m. and then they like, you know, paychecks need to be cut at uh, 8 or 9 a.m. And then the, the computation to actually figure out the payments takes a bit of time, right? So we need to get the data in place uh, in that sort of like a smaller time window uh, reliably, consistently. Um, for the payments to sort of, you know, the business to actually work. And uh, so high level, 
the architecture is we built our own streaming uh, ingesture, which is called Streamio, which is tailing all these change logs from multiple data centers. We think of the change logs as sort of redo logs, which uh, what we are effectively doing here is merging these redo logs into a single Kafka topic. And then that's how we serialize them. Once we put this into the Kafka topic, there is another instance of Streamio, which is going to read from uh, Kafka and then uses HBase as the sort of merge table to produce raw, like raw images onto uh, HDFS. And um, from there on, a Spark EDL job pretty much picks it up. And then uh, this is again an illustration of the point, right? So this decouples the raw trip images, the latest value of a trip is always available on HDFS. So you can provision multiple tables off of the same raw ingestion. And if you want, don't like the table, go back and run another you know, Spark job, or you, know, you can reprovision the table quickly. And um, again, so this is scheduled via Uzi. And then th this is like an exa concrete example of how we are using Spark in a mission critical setting. And I want to leave you with that and then hand this over to Kelvin to go a little more deeper into his project, which is Paracon. Hello. Hey, thank you, Vino. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the project uh, Paragon. Uh, Paragon stands for uh, Paquet inference and conversion. Um, it has been running in production since uh, February this year. Uh, it's the first Spark application at Uber. Um, so uh, Paragon tried to solve this problem. So um, we have, uh, at Uber, we have a lot of JSON data at uh, Amazon uh, S3. And they are produced by um, different uh, Uber application. And we call them uh, uh, data producer. And then uh, we have uh, other um, uh, Uber data application, they consume this data, and then we call them a uh, data consumer. So at the beginning, everything is, everything is fine. Um, people produce data, and then people use the data for different uh, business purpose. And um, they, we have new business uh, requirement, so people may change the data a little bit. They may want to uh, create new fields. Uh, it's still OK. Uh, everything is running fine until one day uh, there's a change which is uh, incompatible uh, to the uh, previous uh, data uh, assumption. Uh, the, uh, the data consumer may assume something about the data, and the change break that, and the application stop working, and it causes the uh, data breakage. Um, we want to solve this problem. We want to avoid this. And the way we do it is uh, we, we are using schema. So what we are doing is uh, we try to put a schema on uh, every pieces of uh, Uber data. So uh, the schema will act like a contract between multiple teams. Uh, the data producer and consumer, they can make a uh, agreement uh, around the schema. And also, uh, our team, we have built a schema evolution and management system around this schema. So whenever someone wants to change uh, the schema, uh, they will go to our system, use our tool to change it. And then our system will run multiple checks and tests to make sure uh, the change will not break uh, anything. Uh, it is always like compatible with the uh, previous version. Um, so this is what we, uh, this is uh, this is where uh, Paragon uh, uh, comes into the picture. Um, so Paragon actually consists of four spot jobs, and they are transfer, infer, convert, and validate. Um, so the first Spark job uh, download the JSON data from Amazon S3 into our in-house uh, HDFS uh, cluster. And then the second job will kick in uh, and infer the Avro schema uh, based on the data. After we have the schema, uh, we will check in the schema into the, uh, our own uh, schema repository and management system. Uh, it is built by ourselves. Um, once the schema is into our management system, uh, our developer engineers at Uber, they can start uh, reviewing and using the schema for their uh, software development purpose. After that, uh, the third job, uh, convert. We'll use the infer schema uh, to convert the original JSON data and convert them into the packet format and put them into the HDFS cluster. Uh, finally, uh, the validate job, 
will compare uh, the original data and the parquet files to make sure uh, there's no uh, data loss and there's no uh, data corruption. And after this point, the data is ready uh, for uh, different people, different engineers or data scientists at Uber to use it for different uh, business uh, application. So then, uh, why Parquet, right? So Parquet has uh, multiple uh, advantage. Uh, the first one is uh, it supports schema. Uh, every Parquet file has a schema inside. Uh, also, uh, from our internal uh, performance benchmark, uh, we found out that it is like two to three, uh, four times faster than our original uh, uh, JSON GC uh, format. Um, it has a very nice feature, which is very useful uh, for us, which is uh, they support uh, column pruning. Uh, at Uber, like most of our topic, we have a lot of columns. We have a wide table. But usually, we don't use all of them in our use cases. So the column pruning can uh, save a lot of IOs for those jobs, because like when they read the data, they don't need to read the full table. They just read what they want. Um, and also, like Parquet has a very strong support in Spark. Um, uh, starting from uh, Spark 1.3, uh, Spark has this feature called uh, schema merging. And as long as your old and new schema, they are compatible, you just store, put the data, put the new data into the uh, HDFS, and then uh, Spark SQL will just work. Uh, let's talk about the individual jobs. So the first job transfer, actually, it is a uh, simplified version of Hadoop DCP. And it is implemented on top of Spark. Uh, we implement a subset uh, feature. Uh, uh, on top of Spark to do the uh, data download. Uh, the approach is pretty simple. Uh, we compute the file list that we want, we want to download, and then we assign them individually to different uh, RDD partition. Um, uh, we have uh, performance optimization that we uh, group the file randomly based on the day uh, to avoid uh, straggler. Uh, because uh, usually like uh, data at the earlier days, uh, they are a lot smaller than the recent data. Uh, and then we also implement a bunch of extra feature for Uber purpose, like uh, we have a lot of Uber specific logic we need to take care of. We integrate them with our internal Spark ecosystem. Uh, we also implement some like homegrown faster algorithm for different things. Uh, we get around the S3A problem in had 2.6 uh, by our own code. Uh, the second job, uh, infer. Uh, the schema inference is mainly done by the uh, JSON RDD in Spark but not directly. And the reason is because the data is dirty. Uh, we have noises in our data caused by different reasons. For example, the, bug, uh, the, the code has bug. So they uh, lock some like dirty data, which cannot be handled or understood by the JSON RDD. So our approach is like we use a two passes approach. Uh, so the first pass, we uh, do the data cleaning. After the cleaning, we pass the clean the data um, to the uh, JSON RDD for uh, schema inference. And the way we do it is uh, we structure the code as a uh, rule-based engine, uh, and then each rule stay a expectation uh, for each record. If the record doesn't satisfy the expectation, then that will get cleaned out. Um, so all rules are heuristic based on our uh, business domain knowledge, and the rules are portable uh, because uh, different data topic, they require uh, different rules. Um, and the third job, uh, the conversion. Um, so the conversion, uh, the logic is also pretty simple. Uh, we assign the days, the data days, into individual RDD partition, and then uh, we do the computation and check point uh, per day, do the conversion per day. Uh, because we trap on, so whenever there's a new job, uh, we don't need to start from the beginning. Or, or if the job fail, uh, we just start from uh, whatever like, uh, we left uh, last time. Um, it is the most complex job among the four jobs, uh, because like, uh, we implement a lot of features there. Like, uh, we support multiple uh, source format there. Uh, we also do data cleaning again one more time there. Uh, we use the infer schema. We track every record. If the record doesn't satisfy the uh, infer schema, we clean it out. We implement our own homegrown uh, JSON decoder uh, for Avro because uh, we cannot find a good one uh, from the open source. Uh, we also do one thing called uh, file stitching. And the motivation for the stitching is um, we did some measurement and we found out, uh, I think it is pretty typical for uh, most uh, uh, places that uh, we have a long tail variation or distribution uh, for our um, 
file size on the HDFS. So we have some large file, which is like very large, but at the same time, we have a lot more small files, uh, which is like much smaller uh, compared to the HD HDFS block size. And this is very inefficient for the um, performance of the HDFS. So what we do is um, we try to stitch them together. And before we, uh, and this is tied to one uh, parquet uh, design decision. So parquet has a concept called uh, parquet block. And the parquet block is a unit for uh, decompression and uh, record uh, uh, reconstruction. So before um, a single record uh, can be read from uh, the parquet block, uh, we have to read the whole uh, parquet block first in the, into the memory. So imagine that we, has, we have a scenario that like, uh, if the parquet block is larger than the HDFF uh, block size, and they are not aligned, right? Then for every parquet block, uh, it will take two I.O. to read the uh, corresponding uh, HDFS block. And these two I.O., one of them you can read it locally from the, uh, because of the data locality. But then the other I.O., you have to do it like remotely over the network. That means like, um, if you like, uh, if uh, the, the alignment is not good, uh, it will cause a lot of network I.O. And uh, the stitching, what we want to do is like, uh, to satisfy, to achieve two goals. Uh, we want to break the large file and combine the small files in a way that uh, we have one parquet block uh, per uh, parquet file. And then each parquet file is slightly less than the uh, HDFS block. So that like in this case, if we can do this, um, each parquet block uh, will be read only by one I.O. and it will be like a uh, local I.O. So I only have three minutes, so I think I need to rush a little bit. So I tried two algorithms. Uh, the first algorithm is pretty simple. Uh, I estimate a constant uh, before the conversion. Um, it is easy to do, but the disadvantage is um, it doesn't work well because like, um, uh, we have this like temporal uh, variation inside the data, meaning that like the constant may work well for the uh, one period of time, like maybe the, the early data, uh, the earlier day data, but then later that constant may not be as good as like for the uh, recent data. So uh, that's why I come up with this like uh, second algorithm, and the way to do it is like um, I push the logic inside to the individual uh, RDD partition, so the RDD partition uh, can do the uh, estimate by its own. And each partition is uh, mapped to one day, so that constant uh, is usually good for one day. And I also try different like strategy, like for example, make it also self-tune like, uh, across the day. And then I measure the uh, the efficiency by two metric. Uh, the first one is uh, use a uh, theoretical model, which is uh, this formula to uh, estimate uh, the the network I/O uh, it will take to um, read the whole packet files. So the formula has two parts. Uh, the first part is the base that you have to pay the I.O. anyway, uh, which is the first part. And then the second part uh, is try to estimate like if the algorithm uh, doesn't do well and go over the uh, HDFS block size, um, then that is the penalty I.O. that uh, we need to pay. Um, and also the second metric I use is like I come up with a, um, a simple benchmark from some of our use case to actually run it over the data and see which one is better. Okay, for the last job, validate is pretty simple. I model the validation as a problem of uh, table join. Uh, I join the old data with the new data and then compare the can and then the data content. Uh, some, some, some production number, uh, so far uh, we have uh, inferred uh, 100 20 uh, data topic. Uh, as of today, we have convert uh, about like 40 topic, and the single largest uh, spot job so far uh, from Paragon, uh, it has processed uh, 15 terabyte uh, compressed data in one job. Uh, there's some lesson uh, I learned. Uh, I basically uh, the lesson. One of the lesson I learned is like um, sometimes we need to implement our own uh, trap pointing. We cannot uh, depend on the uh, Spark, uh, the default check pointing, and the reason is because like Spark always go back and get the data and we compute, right? But in our case, because we get the data from S3 
and we need to pay for the S3 data assets every time. We need to like get the data again, right? Uh, second lesson, there's no perfect data cleaning. Uh, don't be, re uh, be realistic. Uh, the last one is um, uh, the schema parsing uh, implementation can be tricky, and it can take uh, quite a lot of time for testing. Uh, that's it for Paragon, and uh, I would like to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Razor, and Razor is going to talk about uh, his project, uh, Kamadov. Hi everyone. And okay, so the problem we are having with our current Kafka to HDFS ingestion system is basically the fact that it's doing too much stuff at once. So it's consuming from Kafka, it's writing locally to sequence files, it's converting this, uh, the, the file to a parquet format, it's uploading to a temp folder in HDFS, renaming the file and moving it to a file uh, destination in a Hive compatible naming format. So uh, basically, in addition, parquet conversion, it uh, requires lots of memory, it keeps everything in memory, and it dumps it to disk uh, at the end when everything is finalized. Finally, uh, local writing and uploading is also kind of uh, slower than directly writing to HDFS. So because of this stuff, we started to think about decoupling our data ingestion system in two parts. Basically, the raw ingestion, reading from Kafka, writing raw data into HDFS, and a second job that basically converts these raw data into a consumable format. In other words, we want to uh, move the heavy lifting into Spark, uh, which, and, which gives us the flexibility to keep the raw data delivery lean and super fast. Uh, in addition, we want to be able to convert the files that lands in HDFS, the raw data that lands into a, in HDFS, as fast as possible into uh, consumable formats. That, and because of that, we need a streaming job to continuously do this as the files get into HDFS. So this is the overall architecture of our commander system. Basically, we have at the top the raw data delivery, which reads the data from Kafka and, uh, and writes it out into HDFS as raw data. We have a second module called streaming ingestion, which keeps monitoring HDFS reads the data, the raw data, as soon as they are landed in HDFS, converts them into a consumable format, and writes them back to HDFS. We also have a module to, to verify the data that we write out in terms of correctness and completeness, in addition to stitching basically small files. So uh, the main design goals here is the fact that we want the raw data to be in a permanent storage space as fast as possible. We also want to be able to convert them into a consumable format as soon as they land in HDFS. And to, d to do that, we need a Spark streaming ingestor to cook this raw data for us. For now, our uh, basically consumable format uh, is Parquet, but having this architecture allows us to support any other format. If you want to go for ORC, it's just a matter of adding a job to convert it to that format as well. We also want to provide uh, the deduplication. Uh, basically, our pipeline, similar to many other companies, it provides at least once delivery. So in many cases, we end up having duplicate data in our pipeline. Right uh, before this architecture, the, 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 the fact of uh, taking care of deduplication was left to the consumer. They had to do it within their application. But it makes more sense to deduplicate the raw data before converting it into a consumable format. This, having this implemented, it would open uh, the opportunity that like, whenever there is an issue in the data pipeline anywhere, it's, the solution is as simple as replaying the, day, the entire day worth of data through the pipeline without worrying about duplications. Finally, our design goal was to improve the performance of HDFS. So for uh, the, the Kafka topics that they are not high level, high volume in the amount of data they receive, uh, we end up having small files. Basically, we want to uh, respect our uh, latency, end-to-end -end, uh, latency SLA of like 
uh, a few hours. Because of that, for low volume Kafka topic, we end up having small fights because we want to let the consumer to consume it as fast as possible. But over time, these small files adds up, and we're going to end up with lots of small files in HDFS, which is going to affect the performance. So we need a file teacher job that goes over these files, merge them together, and generate like larger files. This is a more detailed uh, overview of the common door architecture. Similar, as I said, at the top, we have the raw data ingestion that dumps the raw data files into HDFS. At the middle, you have the uh, streaming ingestion module. Basically, it's a, a continuously running Spark streaming job that reads the data and converts it into a consumable format and, and writes it out to the HDFS. Uh, we we want to be able to do deduplication. So basically, for any piece of data that we read, we want to see if it's a new data or it's a duplicate. In order to do that, we need to have an indexing. However, the problem is at the scale that we are running this job, we are dealing with like billions of messages per day. So it does a, it's really hard to have a indexing at the, at, level, at the level of individual messages. So what we end up doing is to, uh, was to basically have an index at the file level, output file level. So we use Bloom filters to, 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 give, to see whether a message may exist in a previous file or not. The side effect of that is for those list of files that are potentially con uh, kind of having that message inside, we have to go through the entire files. But that gives us like a faster way of looking the files up in addition to be able to have an index on, the, on that scale. The cr a critical part of this architecture is how this Spark streaming job is going to is going to know uh, is going to know that whether there is a new raw data landed in HDFS or not. In order to be able to do this, we had to implement an iNotify D stream. Okay, so we need an iNotify D stream. Why do we need that? Uh, basically, we want to be able to detect the files landing in HDFS as fast as possible. This allows us to keep the end-to-end -end latency low so in, compar in comparison to using a batch job to detect to do the same thing. Uh, Spark streaming provides file D stream. But that didn't address all our requirements in this case. Basically, file D stream can only go deep as at one level and one directory. In our architecture, we have multiple directories per, per files that are stored. We have topics, data center, and so forth and so forth. Uh, also, file D stream provides the file content directly, where in our case, we were storing lots of uh, metadata in the file name themselves. So we were losing those file name information when using file this stream. Also, checkpointing using file this stream writes out the entire list of files to this. In our case, at our scale, we are dealing with like millions of files being, route, uh, being written out, which wasn't uh, scalable. And uh, finally, if we want to be able to to address like the multi-directory level problems, we had to go deeper. That results in having one job per topic. In our case, in our scale, we are dealing with like thousands of topics, so it wasn't scalable. So that required us to implement the iNotify D stream. Basically, uh, to give you an idea, so we ha I'm sure most of you know that Linux provides the iNotify thing event that basically you can register to a file directory file path and gets notification whenever there is a change to that directory. That can be upload of a file, creation of a file, deletion of the file, so you get notification. Uh, HDFS is also a file system, so it makes sense to have the same uh, notification events for HDFS as well. Fortunately, Hadoop, uh, uh, Hadoop team in Hadoop Summit 2015 introduced the HDFS iNotify event. Our iNotify D stream basically uh, provides an event stream of all those iNotify events happening in HDFS. So in addition, it provides a transaction ID, a unique transaction ID. This allows the consumer to start consuming from a specific transaction, event transaction in the past, rather than starting from the beginning. And uh, so it, you, you don't necessarily have to start from the beginning. You can stop and start uh, at any time from any, any, any point of time. Uh, in terms of implementation, we follow, we, our implementation is very similar to Kafka Direct, uh, uh, Direct D stream. It provides a, a D Spark D stream for the HDFS iNotify events. 
it, in addition, it provides, it makes checkpointing pretty straightforward. In addition to storing millions of files on these, all you have to do is to write a transaction ID to a permanent storage space and then retrieve it whenever you want to receive the previous one. And uh, so we would love to. Uh, we would love to contribute back these uh, iNotified this stream. We've already uh, opened the uh, Spark ticket for that. So if this is something of interest to you, you want to see it, uh, please vote for that, and we'll make it happen. Uh, so our early results show that this stream uh, is pretty stable when, uh, when run on top of Yarn. Uh, one thing I should mention here that HDFS iNotify, it basically uh, reads all the events from uh, all the events happening on HDFS. So, in, in contrast to what's happening in Linux, I notify in Linux, I notify you can basically watch a specific path. So, you go, you get um, notified only for stuff happening within that path. Where in case of HDFS, I notify it gives you whatever is happening in your in, in the entire HDFS. So we have to we had to add our own filtering on top of that in order to be able to watch specific paths or receive speci specific uh, or receive uh, event notification for specific type of files. Uh, but and this was done at Spark level, so still the iNotify delivers you all the events and you have to filter it out. But the good news is it's on the roadmap for the Hadoop team. They are working on adding that uh, path addition to the iNotify uh, event as well. And uh, we also saw that memory usage increases on name nodes when the iNotify is running, which is kind of uh, something expected because you are basically performing more and fetching more data from the name nodes. Uh, so if, if I notify this stream uh, proves itself to be a, uh, an efficient, reliable uh, solution in production in long term, that opens doors for us to many different applications. One potential application is cross-DC replication. We are thinking about moving towards an uh, all active active data architecture. Basically, we're going to have multiple uh, HDFS clusters uh, that needs to be synced up with each other. So using a batch-based disk copy, it basically makes the network utilization to fluctuate. And in addition, it increases the latency, end-to-end -end latency in terms of synchronizing uh, different clusters. So using iNotify this stream, it helps with taking care of these problems. It allows you to sync and move files uh, around as soon as they land in HDFS. Moreover, it over opens the power of Spark to you. So you can do lots of, more, uh, lots of heavy lifting job on top of that. For example, you can filter out sensitive data when moving data out of specific data center. So that opens uh, the door for doing that. So this was uh, our iNotify uh, this stream implementation. Having said all this, I'll hand it over back to Vinod, so he's going to give you an overview of our future roadmap. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, so they're the real engineers who are working on this, so <laughs> I'll just conclude with uh, um, what I want to say, which is um, a lot of time we spend is trying to prepare this ecosystem, uh, get the data in, flowing, it's reliable, and so forth, right? So now that um, We've done that. We're in, in, uh, in uh, Uber terms. Our engines are really revved up, and we are g looking forward to like a roadmap of uh, a lot of fun data processing that we want to do with Spark. And basically, we are investing heavily in our um, like a C Spark SQL based ideal platform, which is going to completely replace all of our ingestion into the warehouse. And uh, we'll, you'll you'll hear more about this in a future talk, hopefully. And uh, in general, open up the data on HDFS to Spark SQL or Hive, uh, some kind of you know SQL on Hadoop kind of story. Um, we already the whole team really loves Spark Shell for you know doing ad hoc debugging of when the pipeline breaks and so forth. So it'll be good to sort of support this as a the regular thing, right? And then uh, we are currently also uh, using Spark in some of our machine learning platform work. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the team is, but they could be exploring like you know the MLlib and such possibilities in the future. Um, most of all, we want to provide some sort of standardized support for Spark jobs at uh, Uber in a way that lowers the bar for like you know doing Spark at Uber. 
And most of all, um, I think we're going to be using Spark Streaming in our next-gen sort of real-time data analytics uh, solution that we are building in-house. And it's called Apollo. So you know, I think this is going to be the next thing that we'll talk about when we probably meet you guys. And uh, of course, I mean, small plug, we are hiring. We are looking for uh, people who, if you these problems make uh, are interesting to you, then uh, please uh, hit us up. And thank you all for listening to our talk. And special kudos for the Uber facilities and the security team, uh, especially Alvin and like Sarah. They've been like super awesome to work with, and they've pulled this massive event. Um, really grateful to you guys. Um, that's it. So that was actually a very fascinating talk. I was really excited to see the cool stuff being done on Spark and Spark Streaming at Uber. Uh, uh, I'm introducing myself. Uh, my name is Tathagat Das, or in short, people call me TD. Everyone calls me TD for obvious reasons. And uh, basically, uh, uh, to introduce myself, I started the, I, along with Matei Zaharia, started the Spark Streaming project back when I was in grad school in Amp Lab, UC Berkeley. And currently, I'm at a software engineer at Databricks and, lead, um, and the technical lead of the Spark Streaming project. Um, and for those who do not know, Databricks is uh, is uh, a company that we, we w the original creators of Spark, uh, we all st came together and op uh, created Databricks, which provides end-to-end -end managed service for data analytics using Spark in the cloud. Anyways, so uh, I know you guys uh, have uh, <coughs> You guys have to go back home. You are all in a hurry, etc. So I'll not take more than ten minutes for you to introduce what are the latest and greatest stuff that has been introduced in Spark 1.5, which came out last week. Uh, so one of the most important things that came out in Spark 1.5 is the project tungsten, uh, which is turned on by default. So for those who are not familiar, project tungsten, what it does is that it uses it it takes the uh, the performance of Spark to the really next order of magnitude, where uh, we use binary processing of in-memory byte uh, byte data to do in-memory uh, to do faster in-memory processing with generated code. So that allows your Spark SQL and data frame queries to be much faster. Uh, and the also the, the lower-level memory management allows uh, much lower GC pauses, which go increases overall performance. Uh, if you want to learn more about Project Tungsten, do do Google it and take a look at our blog. And to learn more about Project Tungsten, uh, there are uh, there are <laughs> Gold or Spark Summit talks as well, uh, going into the details of this. Uh, so in 1.5, it is turned on by default. Uh, uh, beyond the Project Tungsten, in terms of the uh, core SQL and data frame APIs. Uh, what we have done is we have beefed up uh, uh, the built-in UDF library with lots of more than 100 uh, UDF uh, functions uh, that have been added, like date uh, functions, time functions. And all of them have code gen enabled, so which allows the functions to operate super fast. Um, so improved metadata discovery and predicate push on for Parquet. This is to improve your Spark jobs running on Parquet. Uh, support for broadcast outer join and the sort merge outer join uh, in the data frame API and support for connecting to multiple versions of Hive Metastores. So you may, uh, you, uh, different companies uh, often have different versions of Hive running in the same environment. So Spark SQL can now connect to all different versions of Hive starting from, I think, 0.14 to 1.2.1 uh, 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 can be connected to Spark SQL in the same application and um, you can run queries across multiple high versions. Also, we added is very cool visualizations in Spark SQL so that you can visualize what are the logical plans that is generated by your SQL or data frame queries so that you can debug uh, your applications in more detail. Uh, report uh, also the memory usage of each uh, stage is also reported in more detail in the Spark UI so that you can give, if by any chance you're having uh, got of memory errors and stuff, you can analyze and debug your application on and can understand the memory usage of each Spark job. So 
uh, moving beyond SQL, uh, in, the, in terms of the machine learning libraries, uh, we have added a lot of new algorithms and transformers in the new pipelines API. Uh, algos, uh, by algorithms, I mean k-means, naive bias, uh, multi-layer perceptron, et cetera. Uh, trans tra among transformers, count vectorizer, PCA, gengrams. We have also added performance improvements to existing algorithms like sequential pattern mining and LDA. And, and overall, in terms of the b uh, basic API, we have made significant improvements to the Spark, R, and Python API of, m of machine learning. Anyway, second, uh, but the main focus of this uh, short talk is going to be Spark streaming because uh, uh, that is my interest. Uh, but uh, let me go into each of these points in more detail. So the major thing that we added in Spark streaming in 1.5 is back pressure. But to get to that, what back pressure is, let me go through some motivation of why you added this. So, uh, so streaming applications may often have to deal with variations in data rates. For example, in the case of Uber's application, what may have, you, if you're doing data syncing using I notify DStream, you, it might so happen that the downstream HDFS cluster may be slow for some reason. And you, d you don't want uh, your, a uh, Spark streaming application to blow up in memory if the downstream system is slow. You want the sys your streaming application to adjust based on what the downstream systems behave. So, uh, and there can be variations in the data rates, etc. So there is a, a true, st a good streaming application needs to be able to deal with all these sort of variations in data rates and processing rates. Uh, now, the, the before 1.5, the what Spark streaming allowed you to do is set uh, data uh, limits on the data rate so that uh, Spark streaming can keep up uh, with, can, uh, can prevent ingesting data uh, faster than it can handle. And by when I say whether it can handle or not, for those who understand Spark streaming, uh, uh, for to, uh, a Spark streaming application is stable when the batch processing time, so underneath Spark streaming runs small batch jobs. So if the batch processing time of each batch is less than the batch interval, so less, so that it, it, it means that it can process faster than it is creating the batches. Uh, that is the stability condition for Spark streaming. If that is not satisfied, then uh, what happens is that the Spark streaming uh, starts buffering more and more data in the memory, and then therefore, and the queue of the jobs that needs to be processed grows, and the scheduling delay grows, etc. So, bad things can happen if the processing cannot keep up with the rate at which data is being ingested. So, to prevent that, since 1.1, 1 .1, we uh, uh, Spark Stream has the ability to set limits on the receiver rate so that it can cap. You can cap the rate at which a data is ingested by Spark Streaming. But uh, while this works in a lot of stream, uh, scenarios and people are running in production with this for a long time, but it is there are corner cases where this is not sufficient because this solution assumes that the processing rate is fixed so that the, 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 syst the whole Spark cluster can process data at the same rate. It does not account for things like the downstream where the Spark cluster is pushing data to is can could slow down in which the processing rate can reduce because the downstream system is slower. So for these sort of scenarios, the rate limiting, the static rate limiting is insufficient. So in 1.5, we added this concept of back pressure, where the system automatically understands how the processing rate of the, the current processing rate of the system and dynamically adjust the ingestion rate, the dynamically adjust the uh, rate limits of the receiver. So what hap So that allows that if the sinks, basically maybe downstream HDFS could uh, is slowing down it and pushing back into Spark Streaming because it is not allowing Spark Streaming to push data into it fast enough. Spark Streaming will understand that and and push back the original sources uh, so that it does not ingest data from the source uh, faster than it can handle. Uh, so the way it does underneath is it's essentially it uses the batch processing times and the scheduling delay that is used to set the rate limits and it uses and, and it continuously monitors them and uh, figures out using this thing called PID controller theory uh, to calculate what is the appropriate rate limit so the system stays stable. And this PID controller theory is a very well known, it's been known for 30, 40 years as a standard control theory algorithm that is used in industrial control systems for controlling things like v valves in water flow. You want the valve to maintain a certain 
uh, flow level or t uh, or temperatures where you want the temperatures maintain a certain uh, you want the, t uh, the heater to maintain a certain temperature. These sort of uh, feedback loop kind of systems often use PID controller uh, theory to calculate what is the right uh, signal to give to the system. And so uh, we use exactly the same ideas to uh, to set the rate limits in Spark 1.5. Uh, well, in in back pressure, and this whole feature has been contributed by TypeSafe. And so what essentially happens is that uh, if you can see this graph, uh, this is so if let's say your data rate varies using this blue line, and uh, but the system can only the and the Spark streaming system is uh, such that that it cannot ingest and process at this high rate, but can process at this low rate. Uh, the what this, uh, the rate the back pressure when it's enabled will automatically figure out. Uh, that what is the rate limit, which is the yellow, the the orange line out here. What is the right rate limit for the system to uh, use? So actually, the green line, and then the system will automatically ingest only at the rate at which uh, it is stable. It ensures the system is stable. And if you look at the lower graph, which is the pro the processing times, uh, the blue line says is the scheduling delay of uh, which says that uh, how backlogged is the system and uh, basically you don't want this blue line to increase too much because if it increases that means your the system has high scheduled delay it is getting delayed and the system is backlogged and because of these rate limit the given though there are variations in the data rate that is being pushed into the system uh, the system will prevent that data from being pushed and limit the scheduling delay to close to zero so this is what back pressure allows you to do uh, whenever there is changes in the processing rate or receiver rate, etc. So this is actually this is experimental, so it is disabled by default in Spark 1.5, but it's very easy to uh, enable it by setting the configuration Spark streaming back pressure enable to true. It falls by default, and but in future, uh, once uh, we have sufficient feedback on this feature, we plan to graduate it and, and enable it by default. Other than back pressure, so some of the other things that we added in 1.5 is that that we graduated the direct Kafka integration. So uh, the direct Kafka integration uh, allow ba basically allows uh, a much more stable integration with Kafka uh, compared to the Kafka receiver-based approaches from before. And uh, we had introduced it in 1.3, and since then it has pr proved to be much more stable than the earlier Kafka receiver-based approach. So we and it does not use a receiver, so you don't need to configure write ahead log to ensure zero data loss and stuff. It uses Kafka as a log by itself, and uh, therefore it is much more stable in performance. Uh, we uh, in 1.5 we marked that as not as an experimental but a fully graduated API, and so uh, for people who have been waiting for there are waiting for that to graduate uh, you are f uh, free to use we have we have sorted out all the kinks and stuff inside it then we also improved the kinesis integration uh, uh, in 1.5 uh, before 1.5 the kinesis receiver uh, had a few bugs which uh, prevented it from getting zero data uh, zero fault zero data loss guarantees basically it could lose data under some uh, some kind of failures, but we kind of re-implemented the whole uh, receiver from scratch, and uh, we we that ensures fault tolerance without actually requiring write ahead log as well. And it achieves at least one semantics that you can get some duplicates in case of failures, but you will not lose any data. Uh, finally, we also added Python API for existing sources, uh, which was. Uh, in order to improve the parity between the Scala Java and Python API, uh, the Python Kafka direct, the direct Kafka Python API was already there, but it had a limitation that you could not access the Kafka offsets from Python. Uh, but we added that in 1.5. We also added Python API for Flume, Kinesis, MQTT, which has uh, some of, I think, Flume 1 and Kinesis 1 has been quite uh, in demand. What's next? So the couple of things that we are which is pretty much high priority for us that we're going to focus on next in the next few releases 
is on the infrastructure side, we definitely want to improve the state management uh, so that uh, operations like update state by key uh, can become faster uh, uh, and get higher throughput. And then the other thing that is a much requested feature is dynamic scaling for streaming applications. Uh, basically, when a lot of streaming applications, uh, the, the data rate can change throughout the time of the day, and you don't want to accommodate uh, you want to process all the data and keep up with the receiving rate, not push back, but actually consume all the data as fast as you can. But you don't want to have a huge cluster to accommodate for the peak usage uh, continuously. Because when the usage is low, you want to release resources uh, to for being more resource efficient. Uh, so uh, Spark or, uh, does support dynamic scaling for uh, bad jobs. But uh, for streaming, it uh, that doesn't perform uh, well because of the different kind of uh, uh, job patterns that Spark Streaming has. So one, one of our goal is to actually uh, g give a provide a better built-in support for dynamic scaling for streaming applications in particular. From the API point of view, another much demanded feature is uh, Windows based on event time. So what Spark Stream provides right now, for those who don't know, is Windows based on the time when the data arrived into the data, uh, when the time when the data arrived to into the system, which is the uh, also called the batch time in the system. Uh, but uh, what, what often many people want is uh, defining Windows based on the time inside the data itself. So uh, so Windows based on event time is something we do, we want to focus on uh, as providing the users so that users don't have to work around that with their own solutions. Uh, as the final slide, I'd like to just point out that uh, if you are anywhere in, in Europe um, uh, next month, uh, uh, please join us in the Spark Summit Europe where there are lots of amazing uh, Spark and Spark streaming and MLLib talks. Uh, that you can. So I don't know how many of you are going to go to Europe at that point of time, but please do. <laughs> Anyways, thank you. I believe that's the end of the evening. Thank you very much all for coming here and thank you to Uber for hosting us. This, is, this has been an amazing evening.